love to introduce Meredith, who will take it away, and I will be quiet. Fabulous. We never want you to be quiet. Shelly Zalev. All right. So, good late afternoon. I was thinking this morning, um, Shelly just said that we've done 27 of these, 27 power conversations. I think I've moderated like 21 of them, something like that. <laughs> And I want to say that it is the great privilege of the work that I get to do to get to be with Shelly, to get to do this, to get to meet people like the folks who are going to talk to you here. But today, I woke up this morning thinking, today feels different. This moment feels different for all that's going on in the world. There has never been a moment on the issue of gender equality where it feels more exciting to be a part of this conversation, where it feels like there's more interest, it's more in the global dialogue. So. I am really happy to be doing this here at South By today. Um, so yay to that. Um, the only other thing I want to say is that I think all the time we live um, in a society where everything about work has been designed, not, not because they did it in a sinister way, but it's been designed by men for men because most of the workplace and certainly most of the leadership ranks in the workplace were men for so long. Today, almost half of the entire American workforce is women, and it is time to fix that problem. So to Shelley's point, we're gonna do a slightly different kind of conversation here today. This is a conversation about wishes. How do we, how, what do we wish for? How do we, how do we believe we can actually reimagine today's workplace, a workplace that will be, I think I read this morning that slightly more than half, by 2018, slightly more than half, of the workforce will be women. So how do we reimagine the workforce for that? Particularly, how do we reimagine leadership for that? Because we are way behind in women and other issues of diversity in leadership. So we're gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna to get to know this incredible panel. We're gonna talk a little bit about each of their wishes and the solutions they already see beginning to emerge toward making those wishes come true. So let me just take a minute and talk about each of these guys. We have the amazing Robin Hauser, who, if you didn't know before, um, directed the documentary called Code. I think you had a subtitle as well, but it's essentially about gender inequality in the tech industry. Delighted to have you here. You have another big project coming up we'll talk yeah. about. We have Judith, who is a late addition to the panel. Um, Judith was just the chief diversity officer at Dropbox, spent a lifetime, it seemed like, at Google <laughs> before that. Felt before like that. a lifetime. Felt, felt yeah. like a lifetime, I'm sure. Lots to say. Um, we also have Leslie uh, Slayton Brown from HP Inc. as opposed to HP Enterprise, where she's Chief Diversity Officer. We have Howard Ross, who's the co-founder of Cook Ross, and basically works independently as a consultant, founded a firm that works on these issues and has also authored a book on unconscious bias, which you call something else, but I assume is essentially about That's unconscious bias. bias. Um, we have Sherry Slate, who's the head of, you have my favorite title, Inclusion and Collaboration at Cisco. So there in her title is the issue sort of unfolding. And then of course, Shelly, who I think is the foremost um, leader on the planet on convening dialogue on this issue. So bravo again to you. And actually, Shelly, I wanna start with you and I wanna go to two things that you've said very specifically and ask you to explain them. Um, you often say we're admiring the problem. How do we get past that? And then I wanna say you were in a Times article. Shelley was actually the cover feature in the Sunday Style section um, almost a year ago, nine months ago. I got all these bravos. I said I didn't even know it was coming. I had nothing to do with it, which made it even better. And in that article, she told one of our most um, prominent styles writers, Brooks Barnes, that um, a woman trying to be a man is a waste of a woman, particularly in leadership or in the workplace. So expand a little bit on both of those concepts for this group as we get into wishes. I mean, I, I think you know we start with why are we in the situation we're in? And just to set the record straight, you know, the World Economic Forum publishes the top lists of um, countries that are committed to equality and making a difference. Two years ago, the United States was number 28 in the world. Last year, we dropped to 44th place. That's a significant drop. So with all this conversation about 
female empowerment and gender equality and closing the wage gap and eliminating bias and you know, all this shit. You know, we're still going backwards. And so what's very clear is all we're doing is talking about it. It's a great default button to say, oh, I keep using those words, so I must be doing a very good job. And what's happening is that's a replacement mechanism for not activating solutions for change, not understanding how did we get where we are and how are we going to create this next step change. And so we decided the only way to move forward is to move forward. And it's what Meredith said, you know, when I started thinking about how did we get here? You know, most companies in the world, traditional companies, were created over 100 years ago during World War II by men for men, because women just weren't in the workplace. And all of a sudden, you know, women started entering into the workplace, and all we did was dot the I's and cross the T's. We never reimagined the workplace for modern men and modern women. And that's why a lot of the best case scenarios we're learning from the companies that emerged in the last 10 years, because they don't have to create legacy rules or you know, adjust. They can create the new rules based on the types of people they are attracting today. So we are doing all best case scenarios, learning from all kinds of companies, all kinds of leaders you know, around you know, the world on how do we you know, close the wage gap? How do we eliminate bias? How do we create a culture of care so that everyone you know, can rise the ranks and we can attract and retain the best talent and not just the available talent. And when I talked about trying to be a man is a waste of a woman, you know, part of the other problem is women in the corporate world have been conforming to the alpha ways of men because that's how we thought we could get ahead and that's how we could succeed. And the biggest problem is we're missing the feminine qualities of leadership when we do that. You know, it's not about, you know, a man can't have feminine characteristics and a woman can't have masculine characteristics. We need both masculine and feminine styles of leadership in, you know, the talent pool to succeed in business, with the masculine characteristics being more assertive and linear and analytic and aggressive for that matter, and the feminine characteristics, nurturing, collaborative, empathetic, passionate. See how easy it is for me to roll those off? Um, you know, and we need both. And so, you know, that's what I said. We've been trying to conform to being yeah. what we think we're supposed to be. And it's what we say, diversity is not about gender, race, or age. It is about mindset. And we need that thought leadership of masculine and feminine. So we want to encourage everyone to bring their best strengths, masculine strengths, and in here, give the confidence for women to bring their feminine strengths so that we finally level out that talent pool with both, char with both characteristics. And, and that's why my Sarah Jessica Parker quote of trying to be a man is a waste of a woman is probably my favorite quote. So, so I, wanna, I wanna pick up on that and I wanna ask Howard because you, you advise companies on how to get past this and you have a particular focus on bias that can't be seen. Are we, are we biased to those feminine attributes, to uh, leadership attributes, to Shelley's point? Well, I think, that, I think we have to recognize a couple of things. First of all, that um, we'll never eliminate bias because it's foundational to human beings and the way we function. So the question is not can we eliminate bias, the question is can we learn to mitigate it or navigate it so that it doesn't impact what we're doing. And the other is that structure creates behavior in organizations. And it, it, I mean, one thing, at one place I will disagree is that um, like in, in, terms of what we, right? yeah, in terms of what we're saying is we, we've been saying that we're falling back. But I think we have to understand that the natural process of change is not linear. If we look at history, mm. change is usually two steps forward, one step back, even as the arc of history moves towards justice. I mean, I've been involved in social justice work since I went to my first civil rights meeting more than 50 years ago. And if you think about things like what happened in civil rights, even when slavery ended, that was a big forward, and then came the Klan. That was backwards, and then we move up. So that's the nature of change. So I think, I think that's really important for us to understand that we, not leave, that we not lose our passion and incentive and not get frustrated and hopeless, because the swinging back is, is society's attempt to integrate what we're doing. But I think structurally, the very things we're talking about are really important to understand in organizations. Most organizations, even organizations that are created, that have been created fairly recently, are created around basically along the lines of what you're saying, Shelley, a masculine model of operation. And then what we've done is we've taken women and we've stuck them in over time. And over yeah. the last couple of generations, a lot of women have come into those organizations, even leadership positions. And so naturally, I'm not saying it's good, but they, you sort of naturally understand how the women who were able to copy male behavior would naturally be the ones who, were, who, would, who would rise. Now, there are a couple of real challenges in that. One is that we don't get the, the qualities of the feminine that you were talking about, which is a huge loss because that's exactly what we need in most American, not just American corporations, but around the world. 
But the other is that it puts women in this incredible um, conflict, which is in order to be successful, I have to act like this, but that also has a tax associated with it. So that women who have to act that way are actually having to work harder all the time to be more conscious about their behavior. Mm -hmm. And that exhausts people, which is why so many people get to the, a certain level and say the hell with it and leave. And, and so the people who could be successful then um, don't stick around. And in addition to that, the women who bring the quality that you're talking about are compared to the women who are successful. And so men, not, not just men, not just, <laughs> not just men, but also women in the organization say, well, how can you say it's so hard for women to be successful? She made it, but she only made it because she could act like him. And so the woman who doesn't feel like acting like him is compared not only to men, but also to other women who were able to act like him. But then the, the and I could go on for a long time, so I'll stop here at this point. It's exhausting. But then, it is, it is exhausting. But there's one more point, which is if you act too much like him, then comes the B word. So if, I, if I'm aggressive and assertive and, and kick ass and make things happen, then I'm the kind of leader we need around here. But if a woman does exactly that same thing, then she's that word. And so, um, and so the challenge is that, that when, when people say that about her, it's not like they say she shouldn't act that way, only a man should act that way. And this is where the unconscious aspect yeah. comes in place. Just it's just, I really believe you could put me on a lie detector and I would test positively that I really believe we should have women in leadership. It's just the unconscious mind comes in and says, but she doesn't have that executive presence. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where it shows up. There's something right. about her. That's right. There's yeah. something about her I don't feel comfortable with. I don't quite trust that she can handle the group. And that's where, that's where the drag is. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I think the next frontier is to look below the surface and understand both on an organizational level and on an individual level how the unconscious is driving a lot of these tensions. So you should be on every panel ever from here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go I want to go to Robin because Rob, so Robin made this incredible documentary called Code and she's now making another one about bias. So you have to tell us, how does that feel to hear? Is that on point? What's he missing? Yeah, there's a reason that Howard's in my film. Um, <laughs> I guess he's not missing much. No, that's right. Um, so the film's actually about unconscious bias, right? Bias is such an enormous um, subject that I felt like what I was really interested in is unconscious bias. And, and how does that affect us socially and affect our choices also in the workplace? How does it affect the way that we hire, a way that we pay equally or promote, and how, do we, how does it affect the way that we fund ventures? Um, and it's, it's pretty much of an esoteric subject, right? So having to look at this really, and it's harder to prove as we've talked about. Um, one of the questions I had for Howard earlier was, how does unconscious bias lead towards sexism and how is it different than sexism? And, um, and Judith can speak to this as well, but it's, it's really interesting to look at the nuances. It's not exactly like the Mad Men era where somebody just said, well, you're not gonna get hired unless you sleep with you know, your boss type thing. It's very nuanced. And what Howard was talking about in terms of these microaggressions that women feel every day, this, this, this effort that you have to make to work three times harder to prove that you deserve to be in the room and to be at that desk yeah. is exhausting for women. Um, but specifically, you know, how does unconscious bias play a role in, in what we're doing every single day and every one of us is biased to a certain extent? So, so I want to go to you, Judith, here. So you, you left Dropbox, but you went to work for a 32-year-old CEO Correct. who was at the center of a group of people who've been broadly accused, I'm not saying he was, but who've been broadly accused of having you know, complete bias in hiring and retention and not moving fast enough yet he made the decision to hire a chief diversity officer and he went and got somebody huge experience from Google. So how did, what, what does that all feel like from your perspective? And is it, are we making progress on unconscious bias? Are we making progress, to, to use Howard's words, on navigating it or not? Well, to piggyback on something that Howard said, we often think about bias as an individual attitude. But really, that's not the issue. It's the aggregation of those individual biases into an organizational practice. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think about the structures that we put in place to change that. So we have to think about where are those key decision points where bias may play a role, and how do we make better processes and better structures so that bias can be taken out of it. Because we're never going to get rid of our own biases, but we can look organizationally at those structures. And I think that the conversation in the Valley has gotten to the point where people understand that that needs to happen, mm -hmm. but the mechanics of how we shift from the cultures that they have and the practices that they 
have shown have actually made them successful, mm. uh, it's, it's, it's harder. So I think anyone, uh, any founder now is going to say all the right things about diversity. And as companies get larger, and, and, and even you know, Asana hired a chief diversity officer yep. when they had 120 some odd people. So even smaller companies are saying, we, wanna, we want to hire these folks, or like me, um, in those roles. But when you have the conversation, you say, can we fundamentally blow up the way we hire? Yeah. They say, well, you know, we won't get the best people that way. And I'm like, well, all of the research on selection shows that we're really bad at hiring and that we could almost throw resumes up in the air and let them land. And as long as people had a basic set of qualifications, they'd be just as good as any other. But instead, we've convinced ourselves that this idea of a culture fit yeah. uh, is so important. And it gets used like a laser that seems to really find women and people of color. Uh, and it doesn't seem to find as many others. And so I think we need to shift that conversation so that we talk about culture contribution. And I've mm. talked about this before, is, is if I just want to hire you because I want to have a beer with you, I'm not hiring you to make my company better. I'm hiring you to make me feel better. Yeah. And we need to have better goals than that. We yeah. want to make better companies. We want to make better products. We want a better future. Well, we just, we just well did said. a study just yeah. to validate that for a minute for Unilever in eight countries with 9,000 people, and what was amazing, and it was to look at the root cause of stereotype, not that what that we know that there's stereotype or bias or no bias, but what was the root cause? And 50% of women said that stereotypes hold them back personally and professionally. 55% yeah. of women said that they don't show their feminine characteristics because leadership doesn't mm -hmm. you know, reward them. And uh, 64, sorry. 60% of women said stereotypes hold them back. 64% of women say they hold back their you know, personalities because it's not rewarded. 55% of men and women said that it's still a boys club and that men want it to be that way just for that reason. It's not that the pipeline right. isn't full. It's that you know, men choose people they want to go golfing with right. or have a beer with, not just because it, you know, they're choosing the right ones. It's just a very interesting you know, statement that we just reinforced. So, so I, think that's, I think that's a big thing to process. And I want to go to Leslie and Sherry on this, because Leslie is that diversity HP, which I think has 50,000 mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And Cisco has how many thousand? About 75,000. So 125,000 people represented between you. Judith said something really interesting, which was that there is a culture of, I'm already really successful, and I got here through doing a set of things, hiring a, a group of people. How entrenched is that? How much is this about saying it isn't, it, it's not going to be the same things that got you to where you are, Dropbox or Uber, as will get you to the next place? I love that question. Um, so, so we'll start with HP Company was a almost 75 year old company. Yeah. Um, in my time at HP, I've had two women CEOs, and when we split into two in 2015, we were very intentional about establishing the most diverse board of directors in the tech industry, in in the within the U.S. And that intentionality is what really forced us to say, we're gonna shake it up. The next 75 years is not gonna be like the previous 75 years. And so we've been very, very aggressive in looking at and making sure that we have diversity at all levels. So we're at now almost 40% um, women representation on our board of directors and 23, almost 25% um, ethnic representation on our board of directors. So when you start there, when you have that opportunity to start there, you take advantage of that. And so that's what we've done. And so that culture that we've, we've established is now getting pushed down and becoming more pervasive across the company. And, um, and so we're focusing on growth mindset, and that is it doesn't take looking like a man, acting like a man, to be a woman yeah. in control, a person in, in, in power. And, um, and so we're, again, being very intentional, being very deliberate about growth mindset and looking at how we um, teach people um, uh, leadership principles that look very different than what it's been before. So, so let me get really specific with you. I read that you said it is every one of those 50,000 people's Absolutely. job to make this a more diverse workplace. How do, you, how do you really do that at scale? How do you really push that down to 50,000 people? So, so our goal is um, twofold. One is embed diversity and inclusion across the company. Yeah. 
And the other is, is uh, really about reinventing the standard in which we evaluate and measure the success of diversity efforts that we're doing. So when, in your, when we embed it across the company, it has to start with our CEO, the voice of our CEO. And now, as we have this board, this very diverse board of directors, we actually have a female is um, the chairperson of that board of directors um, as well. And so we're very deliberate, very in intentional in with our employee resource groups or business impact groups, the work that they do. Everything is tied back to business um, outcomes. And so you had mentioned earlier, you know, so Leslie, you come from a marketing background. Yes, and in a marketing background, you don't, you have to prove ROI. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we're approaching it. It's about how ultimately we change the trajectory of our hiring processes, change the systemic way in which we're doing this, right? So it's not just throwing those resumes up, but it's looking at, and we haven't gone to blind resumes, but we have removed bias in the system in being able to look at, move beyond the name and the stereotypes that come with the names and what fraternity or sorority or golf club you are a part of and really drilling into leadership principles that we can pull out yeah. in, um, from those resumes. So it, it starts with leadership yep. and training people essentially how to behave better right. as leaders. Sherry, let me go to you because you've got the same scale issue. Give us a sense of like, what, what's structural, and then what's out there that isn't about structure? I have to say, um, Leslie, beautiful job, and I commend you with what you've done in such a short time. Mm -hmm. um, making that kind of change from the top down doesn't happen overnight, and I will tell you, in this game where it's about leadership by example, so let me just stop mm -hmm. and say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're living in a time of... We need this to is the amplification effect working right here, I just want to say. Shine fairy, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah. That, and we have a girl crush with each other. <laughs> okay, because that's very clear. I'm, I'm loving this right now. Um, it, it's, it's time for pattern interrupt, right? So we're living in a really different landscape, right? This is digitization. What's happening with digitization is everything around us, everything that you know to be true about how you get jobs, what jobs look like, how long jobs last, breaking. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. breaking. And so the role of a chief diversity officer in this landscape is to make sure that we are sitting at the table asking the right questions to ensure that we are instrumenting inclusion at the point of decision making because that is what is a, that's possible for us now. We can instrument inclusion at the point of decision making to change the equation for diversity. Now the reality is we're at the forefront of this journey. But if we are not sitting at the table asking the right questions about what is the process and the evolution of work going to look like in the next five, or let's say 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, five years from now, we're going to miss the best opportunity to create opportunity and possibility for every single woman sitting in this room, mm -hmm. every single woman, I don't even know for broadcasting, out there that is in earshot to contribute. Mm -hmm in unprecedented ways, unprecedented ways. So when you ask about structure, yeah. the structure that we're thinking about is how do we envision, reimagine work from the standpoint of, it's not about the desk, it's not about the phone, it's not about the four walls we sit in, it's about how can people, extraordinary people, how do we welcome them in to work in life from wherever they are in the world? What our structure is going to look like, it's not fully baked yet, is that our system policy practice will enable the power of participation of people in every business outcome of our company. Amazingly said. Howard, I have to ask you, because again, you sort of evaluate this stuff for a living, what's working, what's not. You advise companies. When you hear that, do you say we're on the right track, and what are you not hearing? So we've just all gone down the line here. What are you not hearing that we should be talking about to bring the workplace? So Shari's just given us our what she wishes for. What are we not hearing that's got to fill in? Well, I think I think all, all of this stuff makes sense, but I think at a more as essential level, really, we have to recognize a couple of things. First of all, we have to recognize this is not a women's issue; it's a gender equity issue. Yeah. And it's critically important for us to realize that because men are trapped into their roles as much as women are trapped into theirs. And neither really knows how to get out of those roles. And it, not only that, but, but there are di the, the core um, uh, currency here is power. 
And there's lots of research now that shows that the behavior that we attribute to men is really power-based behavior. It's not so much inherently male behavior, it's power-based behavior. So just for example, um, the notion that, that um, men uh, uh, perpetrate sexual harassment more um, has been explored lots of different ways. There's some researchers at the uh, University of Cologne and University of Florida that have done these experiments where they, through the way they do the experiments, they eliminate the gender factor and they give both men and women power in certain situations and their behavior becomes sex more sexualized, regardless of whether it's a man or a woman. When you have power, that begins to happen. And so one of the things that we have to recognize we have to be careful not to put ourselves in a circumstance where we think that simply by putting women in power positions, we're going to change the overall dynamic. I mean, ask, ask um, wow. the UK whether having Margaret Thatcher in power brought more of the feminine in, for example. <laughs> you know, obviously it didn't. Uh, so, and, and that means looking at our organizations and the structures of our organizations from the ground up in terms of what, what kind of a structure would actually encourage um, gender equity. You know, for example, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with senior level men who I've been coaching or you know, supporting in, in, through these efforts who tell me, God, I wish that I could work a more reasonable schedule and be able to go to my kids' soccer games and be able to you know, attend their, their plays at school and all these kinds of things. But if I did that, I wouldn't be taken seriously in my job. And I'd be willing to take, this one guy in particular who was the uh, head of the LA office for a major law firm that I was working with who said to me, you know, I make $875,000 a year. He said, I would, I would easily, to be able to work 70% of the time, easily give up a couple hundred thousand dollars of that salary in a heartbeat. He said, but if I want to be successful in this firm, there's no way I would be that if I did that. And so we have to really recognize that because what that calls for then is more allyship. I mean, one of the things that I'm talking to a lot of our clients about who are on the more progressive side of doing this work is rather than having, for example, a women's employee resource group or business resource group or you should call the business impact groups, you know, yeah. to have a gender equity ERG where men and women who are committed to gender equity come together. And if you still want to have some times when men and women talk separately, then one organization in particular, the way they do that is they come together once a month for a three hour meeting and the first hour men and women are separate and then they come together and share what they've discovered in their conversation and then spend the rest of the time collectively looking at situations. Because what we don't realize is that some of our behavior reinforces those dynamics. It reinforces the notion that, that gender equity is a woman's job in the workplace and the women will take care of this rather than that we all have to work on it. So, so, you, so many interesting things there. You just made a very, very big point about power. And what I want to ask everybody, so a jump ball question is, um, is power, and Shara, you've got collaboration in your title. Are you suggesting, Howard, that power in and of itself becomes something that you have to think about more in terms of collaboration? Or? Absolutely. We know because we can study the neurocognitive science of it. I mean, one of the things that I've done is really, I mean, we were talking about this at lunch and I, and I was saying that uh, one of the challenges we've had in the diversity space, I think we would all have to admit, is that diversity practitioners have a well-earned reputation for saying things because we hope that they're true rather than because we can prove that they're true. <laughs> and so one of the things that we've been trying to turn to in our work is more evidence-based research. And for me, that's meant studying the neurocognitive science that we're learning about how we behave. And so there's a, there's a guy up at uh, McMaster University, for example, who studies power in the brain. And what we know is that the more power people attain in life, regardless of gender, the less empathy we produce. Mm -hmm. Empathy is measurable. It's produced as mirror neurons from the, from the premotor cortex of the brain. And the more people have power, the less we have empathy. And the reason we think that's true is because when you have power, you're mostly responsible for making shit happen. And so your focus is on what you need to make things happen. When you're in a low power position, in order to make things happen, you have to look around for the people around you yeah. in order to, to manage that. So what that means is that as we get into power positions, we have to consciously develop practices which sustain our empathy. So that means as a CEO, for example, to meet with things like your employee resource groups or your business impact groups, to spend time with people who are in low power positions in your organization. And I don't mean just quickly walking around. Yeah, so I have to ask Leslie because she just said she worked for two women CEOs and I know she works with a CMO who's made a huge issue of gender equality and he's, it's a man. Yeah. So does power look different at HP? Has that changed? It has that? changed. And I, I'm listening to you and part of me says, God, I want to challenge you on that. But the other part of me says, I, I'm in agreement with it. However, when you bring in those practices of helping shift the power structure, 
and you change behavior, you change power structure. And that's the dynamic that I see happening, and that's a cultural shift that's occurring within HP. And that's, that excites me. You're all making the point that sort of structure yeah. first. So I want to now ask you to each go down the line, and I suggested you do this in advance, so I know you've given it some thought, and I want to start with Robin, who is now on her second film in this topic area. What do you wish for? What do you imagine the workplace should be like? And where do you see a solution that's beginning to get us to that place? Well, I think optimistically, I wish that at some point we won't even have to talk about this because it's just given. <laughs> I mean, I think it's kind of crazy that we're still talking about gender equality at this point. Um, you know, Mary Tyler Moore was talking about it on, on her show. When, when was that? In the 60s, yeah. probably? Um, so it's that shocking can I, to Can me. I push you on that? Why do you think that is? We often talk about the fact that it's crazy, that it's, we're still having the conversation. Why are we still having the conversation? I mean, other than the obvious that there's insufficient Well, we're quality, having the conversation because we need to have the conversation, right? right? And, I, and I think that um, somebody asked me if this was just another fad, like another feminist fad. And I thought, boy, you know, I, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's frightening to me. Um, I, I, I'm just sort of shocked. And this is why I wanted to make a film about it, because I actually really wanted to dig deep and look into the science behind it, the brain science behind this. How, what is it? Can we not get, we can't get beyond our own human, you know, uh, uh, problems really in this, in this case. So I think that it's a really interesting um, study on psychology, study in human behavior, um, in power, and in business structures. So between you and Howard, I think we're getting, we can't change brain, brain science. We have to accept it, so then we have to change the structure that enables it. What is we that know, what what we know is that we cannot change the fact that we are biased, right? Yeah, if you yeah. have a brain, you have bias. And as Howard mentioned before, there are a lot of reasons that biases are also can be good. There's right. a reason we have them. They're protectionary in a lot of ways. So what we need to do is create structures in order to help mitigate or eliminate bias. Yeah. So if we have something called like me bias, and when somebody walks in the room and we have to hire and we're in a hurry because we cut corners, biases help us cut corners. It's not a good thing when you're hiring. You want to hire the person that's like me. We've always been told to go with our gut. When you're hiring, it's not necessarily a good thing because you're gonna go with somebody that just is feel, they're like you, it's easy. You're not gonna ask them the same questions likely. And as, as to, to steal one of Judith's quotes, you create this cocoon of yes mm. around you. And that's not necessarily going to create the best environment that's going to make products that are going to serve a diverse group of people. A right? diverse world. So all. Judith, I love the cocoon of yes. I actually mm -hmm. hate the idea of it. I love the phrase. Um, talk about what you wish for and what gives you optimism that that may come. So I think that for a long time, we have had a perception of shortage. So we live in a culture of shortage, right? This idea that we have limited resources, we have to compete over them, we have to compete. And that's why you have power dynamics, because I win and you lose, there's not enough. Uh, and I'd love us to reconceive not just the workplace, but our whole mindset. Because if we had a culture of uh, plenty or a culture of excess, where we understood that having more women doesn't mean fewer men. Right? It's how do we make this pie bigger for everyone? And I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about the future of work in the face of general AI, which is coming, in the face of increasing automa automation, which is definitely coming. And a lot of that conversation is about the automation of low-skilled work. But I actually think that as our AIs get better, we will have an incredible automation of high-skilled work. Yeah. And so then we as human beings have to think about how we spend our time, why we spend our time, who we spend our time with. And when work is in this culture of plenty, optional, it's gonna be all about that interaction and, and the ideas and the creativity. And I think that diversity has a lot to say to that. Now the danger is that the people who are creating the technology need to have that mindset, that plenty mindset, that diverse background, so that we're not creating a future that excludes and that kind, kind of per, perpetuates what we see. Yeah. But that is my hope, is that we, we essentially uh, get beyond a lot of these issues because we, we don't have the shortage, right? Yeah. We have this cultural mindset. And what you just suggested in that kind of brilliant take on what's happening is that it's all about to change so much in terms of who is employed. And there are certain parts of the service sector, so even um, 
less skilled work that we'll need more of because of the humanity associated with it. So, so Leslie, what about you? Give us, what do you wish for? And you've talked already about what HP is doing. What's, what's the stuff you're not doing yet that you well, wish Well, I think, change? you know, when I think about um, HP and I think about some of the new companies, the startups that are um, just coming to bear now, um, HP does business in 170 countries across the globe. Other companies will be doing the same, and so we do have to think about things a little bit more holistically. And as Sherry mentioned, it's a journey. So yeah. these things don't happen overnight. So when I think about, and I, uh, when I try to reimagine um, what the workforce will look like in the mega trends and mega cities and, and different things that will, um, that will erupt um, uh, here, I think about a, a, a workplace where you have your career stages and life stages is very personalized to people's needs. Mm. And, um, and that would allow for you to work 75% of the time, make less money if that's what it takes. Um, but it, it allows everybody to just bring who they are, where they are, whether you are a, you know, a new grad hire and you're ready to start a family within three to five years or, or whatever, the company meets you where you are and yeah. provides that support, that level of support. Spoken like a marketer, meet the customer on their own <laughs> terms. So I, that's that's yeah. brilliant. And Howard, a wish. I think if I really had one, it, it, it's um, very broad, and that is I think we have to focus more on understanding human consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a fundamental myth that we all operate on as a culture now. I don't mean every single person, but as a culture, and that is that we make decisions rationally. And every bit of what we're learning about the brain says that that's not the case, that all of the decisions we make are, are, are almost all of the decisions are, that we make are emotionally driven. And this is especially true in business environments. Um, but it's also true in politics. Robin and I were talking about this last night. I mean, you think? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you look, if you look at, for example, this last election, if those of us don't wince when we look at this last election, um, you know, this conversation about how how Hillary Clinton, the most qualified person ever to run for president, yeah. didn't win. Well, the reason is because we've never, ever, ever voted for president based on qualifications, ever. Mm -hmm. That's never been the reason we elect leaders, and that's why people were so confused by this. I mean, we could go through all the different elections and say Kennedy would never have beaten Nixon and Obama would never have beaten Clinton the first time or beaten McCain or, you know, one after another. It's got nothing to do with qualifications, but people kept using that as a reason. And so we missed what was actually going on. Um, and the same is true in organizations. We operate on a cognitive behavioral level in organizations, but, the, but we don't think the way we think we think. We actually are driven by our emotional reactions and our unconscious drivers. And there are entire fields now, behavioral economics and other things that are looking at this relative to the way we make business decisions as well. So I think we have to turn more inward. And what that's going to require is for us to have more time to think about the way we're making our decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly counter to the speed of life that Sherry was talking about a moment ago. Because we're living now in this you know, point blank kind of uh, life where it feels like we're Wonder Woman with her bracelets trying to deal with life right. every day. We don't have time to let the slow brain come uh, out. Although money and earning aside, I think Judith just told us that computers are going to work, you know, machines are going to be doing most of the work, so we're going to have a lot more time on our hands. I don't know yeah. if that's what you were getting at, but Sherry, your wish. My wish. Um, okay, so uh, digitization, $19 trillion value creation opportunity for companies that harness it over the next 10 years. Um, what it's going to create is absolutely very different consumption models for talent. That means something very different for every single one of us that want to contribute our time, our knowledge, our skill, mm. our passion to creating and solving for the most complex challenges in the world. Look, my wish is that we create the place and space where work can get done wherever you are. We create the muscle in each of you um, that allows you to have the right mindset, skill set, and tool set such that you see the opportunity and you choose to participate in creating your fair share of that value for a company, a community, an industry, a country. Um, it's not as tangible as, uh, <laughs> as, as you might like, but I, that's what I see, and it's here. And if we don't start seeing that far forward, 
we're going to miss the opportunity to play in the things like, I'm going to tell you, in the next 18 to 24 months, you're going to see the elimination of job descriptions as you know them. So how do you then choose to participate? In the next 24 months, we are going to absolutely have the opportunity for you to choose how you want to contribute your time, your value, your experience, and choose the opportunities that you want to contribute to inside of your own company. I'll give you an example. Inside of Cisco right now, we have a free market, um, a free marketplace, right, where employees outside, inside of their day job can choose to basically contract out extra time on other projects. Look, we're piloting that internally. I will tell you, that is gonna be the way in which you are gonna be able to create extraordinary value for yourself, for companies, and or for multiple companies. The name of the game, I think, long term is that it's not about a badge, it's about your contribution, your power of your participation mm -hmm. in the business outcomes of companies, countries, institutions, communities, you dot, 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 dot. <laughs> I am so inspired by that. Yeah. Shelly, that was amazing. Yeah. Hey, sister. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah I think um, it comes back down to also accountability. Mm. And I think that's something that's been seriously missing is, you know, we all have chief diversity officers check, check the box. And I think, you know, Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, you know, always says you can't treasure what you can't measure. And I think, uh -huh. you know, accountability is a really big, you know, a really big challenge. I also think that it is about fixing middle management. It's the messy middle. Yeah. We start 50-50, we end at about 17%. We lose, you know, women in general in middle management, opt in, opt out. And Ariana Huffington taught me something at the World Economic Forum and it was just so smart. She says, we do exit interviews. We ask people what happened. You know, but they're already leaving. What about entry yeah. <laughs> interviews? What do you need? And it goes to what you, oh, you're I talking about, that. Sherry, which I'm actually designing an entire tool as a result of that, and I'm gonna be life stage profiling. So you said it so much more eloquently, but I'm kind of obsessed with this idea of life stage profiling, that when you're in middle management, because that's where the biggest problem is, profile by life stage, not about age, not about what job you have, but where are you in your life? And so you can define, I have chil small children, and I can't you know, travel all the time, and I can't work these crazy, ridiculous hours and keep my lights on for no reason. And then you know, it is up to the company. If you want me to rise up, then help me manage that job, put me in that leadership position, but modify. So I'm working on a really big you know, concept, which we need to. I see you. I know. <laughs> I'm so damn excited about this because it's, it's, change happens when you just decide to take that next step. And I think that's really what it takes. And it's also the redefinition of power because I heard you loud and clear, Howard. And I think that to me, it's reimagining the word power. Power to me is about you know, compassionate leadership. It is about responsive leadership. It is about collaborative leadership, by the way, feminine characteristics. And you know those are caregiving characteristics, and yet we're losing our best leaders to caregiving. And just because you're a woman at the top, which, which we talk, doesn't mean you're changing those rules. It isn't about whether you're a man or a woman. It's about responsive leadership and understanding that to attract the best talent, you need to change the rules, which to me comes back to culture. And I heard something interesting the other day that I think is, um, I don't know what this means yet, but I, I'm processing it. But they said, when there's a hurricane named after a woman, oh, yeah. <laughs> people don't, <laughs> did you tell me this? No. It was, it was in the sizzle reel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's in the, I put it in the sizzle okay. reel. Okay, Robin That's taught right. me this. I didn't know where I got this from, but I internalized it. But when it's named after a woman, you don't think it's going to be that bad, you know, even though it, it is. And the other is, people say, when a woman's running a country, you have less war, because women don't want to go to war. We want to solve it in a more yeah. collaborative fashion. So I'm hoping, and my wish is for collaborative, responsive leadership, and that's when culture will change so that we finally make progress and take that next love step. Love it, love it. So I think we have time for a few questions from the group, and I don't know if we have a mic going around, but I think Alan is running with a champagne glass together, and we are going to send the mic and the champagne. <laughs> questions for this esteemed panel. I have a 
quick question. So in my mind, I see this sort of prevalence of women in technology and women in the workplace and it being so important and significant, a challenge, kind of as like a wave, like it comes and goes. Like sometimes mm -hmm. it grows in volume and then it kind of recedes and then it grows again and it recedes. Like how do you guys envision it currently and what do you think should be the pattern that it follows besides sort of being something that's so prominent and important to kind of just dying down again. Um, what, what, what do you, th what is your vision? Like, what are crescendos or? What is the, so I, I want to understand how you're measuring the crescendo because I think for, for all of us here, it never dies down, right? This is work that we've been doing, that we continue to do. We have setbacks, we go forward, but the work, we've been doing the work. You know, Howard's been doing this work for 50 years. Yeah. Many of us on this panel have spent our lives like, so I don't see that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess that's my question. Like, for me, I see it kind of as something that comes into the mainstream and then it dies down. And so, is it media does, attention? Well, right, media attention, and in terms of just it being on everyone's radar as something that is not fixed, that needs to continue to be addressed. Um, again, like, you see it in the media and then it just dies. And it's like, we're still not, there's still not equality achieved. Yeah, I mean, I, I could weigh in on this for a minute. I mean, I think, I think this is, it goes back to a little bit what I said at the beginning. I mean, first of all, I think this is the way change happens. You know, if we look historically at the way change happens, it's rarely linear. You usually have it going like this and then cut back a little bit. I think one of the things that's happening in um, particularly corporate America is that we've been doing work now pretty, pretty um, definitively on diversity issues for about 30 years. Um, and the reality is that a lot of the things that we've been trying haven't worked. You know, particularly diversity training, the way it was done classically, we know now doesn't work. Um, and I know a lot of people in diversity push back on all these studies that show that diversity training doesn't work. And, and some of the studies are a bit flawed in that what they do is they put all training in a bucket. And I, I was saying this morning, it's like saying, do you like restaurants? You know, you'd say, what restaurant are you talking about? We know that the kind of training that we've done for decades which is, you'll never understand what it is to be a woman, you'll never understand what it is to be a person of color, um, actually is regressive. It actually causes people to, to, to a turtling effect on yeah. people's fault. We also know that the kind of training that helps people understand how they make decisions actually creates more egalitarian behavior. But the problem with a lot of um, diversity programs that I'm seeing, and I think we are having a bit of a backlash now beginning to start again, is that we try all these things, they don't produce the level of results that we think they should produce. And then people say, why are we spending all this time and money? Why are we running people through all this stuff? Let's just get back to business as usual. And then, you know, and then another wave comes and another wave comes. So I think we have to own, those of us who are in the industry have to own an accountability for whether or not the things we're actually doing work. And this gets back to what I was saying before about actually doing evidence-based research and tracking. You know, when you hear Leslie talk, when you hear Sherry talk, you can hear that there's, um, that there's a focus on watching the impact of what they're doing. You can hear that in their speaking. And so it's no surprise that they're gonna be successful, as opposed to a lot of places where it's still, let's throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. And, and that frustrates people because the business of business is business. I would also say that I think maybe also a part of your question was, you know, why do we see it sort of ebb and flow from like the media and why is it so important? And I, and I think that the tech industry had a lot to do with that, but also, because the tech industry is predominantly white male, but there's an economic reason behind it too, right? By the year 2020, there's gonna be over a million unfilled computer science related jobs in the US alone. And with our current administration, that number could be much higher. So when people start, you know, they look up from their iPhones when you start talking about money. It's just the reality. And so we're in this situation now where we will not be, we meaning American, America, we will not be at the forefront anymore of technology or anything if we can't fill these roles. So there's an economic force behind this as well, and that brought sort of the spotlight to the lack of diversity in tech. I think in addition, there's the, the lack of innovation. And so, and that's what we're seeing is when mm -hmm. you have women in leadership positions, when you have women and their perspective at the table, you get greater innovation. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't pay attention to this, we are going to be left behind, yeah, right? Absolutely. And I think traditionally, at least from my perspective, I've seen sprinklings of people trying to do different things. It's not a one size fits all for our, our different companies. It, it's, you have to look at your unique culture 
and, um, and devise and develop programs that meet the needs of your particular people. And so and that's why I say when I imagine that future of looking at career stage and life stage, mm -hmm. that if we were to all do that, because it's not going to take one company to fix this issue yeah. in the tech industry or in any industry for that matter. And so it's a collaborative effort that has to happen. Even in, in a company your size, you even have to have different styles for different people in the yes. company. And different um, in industries. So marketing yeah. versus labs and engineering is, is very different. You have to be able to understand the perspective and the needs of those particular um, employees. So, so oh, sure, go no, ahead. No, 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 please. Um, I actually think your question's really profound. And let me tell you why. It makes me stop and pause, because this is not the first time that question's been asked. It goes back to your question, how did we get here? And when we think about the reason why we um, find ourselves in the same place over and over and over again, why is that, Howard? Why do we find ourselves in the same place? It's Howard's fault. That's the no, but, <laughs> but I, I do think that is something that we need to um, take note of. Once we start to see the things that do work today, understand that they are insufficient for tomorrow. So the question that you asked yeah. is the same question that was asked in 1950. A little bit different, right? It was the same question that was asked in the 70s. A little bit different. Same questions asked, you can tell me if I'm wrong, because I, I was two in 1970. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> He's been doing this, he can I tell you, my mentor forever. It's the same question asked in 1980. Here's the thing, when we, use the same solutions and we think they are going to be effective when the landscape changes, we are fooling ourselves, which is why you are asking us that question today. If we think that the stuff that worked 12 months ago or three years ago is going to work in the next 18, 24, five years from now, it's not. And so somebody else, not you, hopefully, um, somebody else will be asking this question if we don't think about different solutions to solve this opportunity. You know, Albert Einstein so, says that, by the way. Yeah, can you, you, can you yeah. He says, Albert Einstein says, you can't change the game with the same mindset that got right. you there. And you know, what's really interesting about what you just said, because that is amazing, now I'm gonna think about that at three in the morning, of course, <laughs> is also 10 years ago, we didn't have change wasn't that you know it, it, drastic yeah. because it was pre-technology and we lived in a linear world today we live in a multi you know uh, a multitasking world on steroids i mean the whole world changed with technology as an enabler and yet the systems haven't we're still using a linear mindset to solve you know today's problems mm -hmm. and i think that that's just you know really interesting so that's this is yeah, I, think, yeah. I, mean, I think the other thing we have to realize is that this is true for human beings. I mean, think about it. How many people here have worked through your issues with your parents and you felt like you passed that until Thanksgiving? <laughs> you know? And then they come back. But the next time they come back, they're not as deep. And then the next time they come back, they're not as deep. And, and we live like diversity is this thing we're going to fix. We're never going to fix it. We're always going to be on this journey. And, and it, it, is, it is actually a spiral journey. It's not a linear journey. And we'll come back to the same issue in another generation, like Sherry's saying, and we'll look at new aspects of it. And then we'll come back in another generation and we'll look at new aspects of it. And that's the nature of human change. And we have to understand it, because we set unrealistic expectations for ourselves that we'll put a training program in place and we'll change some structures and systems. And then diversity will be finished and we can go back to business. It's not true. It's, it's, more like, it's more like computer technology, which is now a lens that we see everything we do through. So we have to embed it. So when you talk about embedding it throughout your organization, that's a direction we have to move in, as opposed to having this diversity department that does all this stuff for us. Totally. So I, I think I'm watching it get dark. We're in Austin. There are tacos to be eaten and tequila to be drank. Um, so I, we always wrap these panels with best things heard. I just leaned over to Robin and said I've done like 21 of these. I think this is the most meta conversation we have ever had. And I want to thank you all for pushing us to think about this in a much, um, frankly, in a much more sort of forward-looking and holistic way than we have. Uh, Shelley started us out saying talk is a replacement mechanism for activating change. We heard um, about the tax of acting like someone else, the exhaustion that comes of that. We will all walk out of here thinking about Leslie's 
Leslie said, intentionality gets you things like 40% of your board members are women or people of color. Shari said, and then I think she stuck with this and kept pushing the conversations here, it was amazing. All the patterns are being interrupted. Howard talked about the currency is power and it's about what happens to anyone when they come into power. And I love, I'm gonna be waking up at three in the morning thinking about this one. Call me. More power, <laughs> I will call you. More power <laughs> equals less empathy. Robin yeah. said in the beginning, and she came back to it, she's making a film, second film about it. Structure, we can't eliminate bias, but structure can make us work better even knowing that we have biases. I love, I don't know who said this, I think it was Judith, just don't go with your gut. I love that, I'm gonna remember that. She also said work as a culture of abundance. Work needs to be personalized to our lives and career stages. We talk about personalization of products and marketing, we don't talk about personalization of work. And then Howard said in the room, pause, we make all our decisions emotionally and not rationally anyway. So let's think about work that way too. Shelly said, and we should all go away thinking about this, change happens when someone decides to take an action. That's why we do the power conversations. And I will end on Shari's point, and you raised this with your question. The world has changed, so too must the solution. So thank you all. What an extraordinary. Woo! Woo I want her. I want her recap.